on today's show. Tesla's earnings call will yield a lot of information that might excite many Australians. VW ID3 charging plans revealed and I launched a petition for EV incentives in Australia. G'day, my name's Chris and this is your show about everything happening in Australia and well, from around the world in the space of renewable technologies such as electric vehicles, solar wind, batteries and well more. Welcome, please subscribe, it does, it does help the channel, it really does. And if you want to take it to the next level, come over to here to Patreon where you get exclusive behind the scenes content, early access, polls, news and even Q&A sessions with me live that, well, you just can't get here. And big shout out to my uh, producer level patrons, and that's Ashley Hill, Nigel Farrier, Ray Johnson, and Tessa and the Gong. Thanks to those guys for uh, supporting me at the $15 level or more. All right, let's get into the news, shall we? Audi has agreed to the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement and is working on making its fleet CO2 neutral by 2050. Audi says that to achieve the same, it sees electric cars as part of the global of well, part of its goals in its global campaign. Noting that renewable power like wind and solar might need storage options during the like high yield periods, or maybe a bit of a backup for when the sun isn't being it's been a little bit shy and well the wind isn't blowing. Audi notes that as the number of EVs increase, the number of mobile energy storage units also rise. So, folks. This is the energy revolution. And to say that last statement, much loved by fossil fuel vested Neanderthals who, whose only goal is to like to profit from the world warming up, they don't get this. So let's agree, our job is to educate and inform. So as we transition to a cleaner and greener future, it involves like multiple solutions, not just solar not just wind, but like hydro, batteries, EVs, and well more. Yeah? So what Audi and the Hager Group are co-developing is for Audi cars to have the ability to provide like bi-directional charging. Now, this is nothing new. Nissan has already been doing this like with the Nissan Leaf in Japan. But nonetheless, I think we'll see more and more car makers offering this as an incentive to like getting a new car, particularly one that's got a battery in it. The rewards here are obvious. First, the battery of like say an Audi e-tron could supply a single family home with energy for around one week. It can provide power during a blackout or owners could buy, ele buy electricity in when the utility company rates are high. Remembering that we only use our cars for like four to 8% of the day anyway. That's like one or two hours. So instead of just sitting there looking pretty, why not have it save you some money? Reviews have started coming in for the new Polestar 2, a Tesla Model 3 competitor, which according to Robert Lewin from Fully Charged, is actually a great drive, well built, and will no doubt encourage Tesla to do better. I've left a link to the video below, so if you wanna take a look at it with his initial impressions, please do. But one thing that actually caught my attention was that this car is the first to feature an car interface and infotainment system powered by Android. For those unfamiliar, Android Automotive OS, to be precise, is like basically Google, who they build like multiple things, both hardware as well as software, have designed this for car makers to actually integrate into their cars to control things such as your HVAC, car settings, and well, obviously, entertainment. Not to be confused with Android Auto, which is handled by your phone. This is actually baked into the car, so to speak. And it becomes like a handler of many different devices, all integrating seamlessly. The idea being that like what well, users and businesses who use this platform benefit from the rich, rich ecosystem designed and supported by Google. You know, that what well, and apps and what well, features, they can obviously be um, up graded, updated, and downloaded as your chase change, or perhaps you just want to maybe change things up a bit within your car. Polestar provides three years of internet connectivity included in the price of the Polestar 2 when you buy it. UK-based Electric Assisted Vehicles Limited launched last week the all-new EAV 2-cubed e-cargo ultra lightweight commercial vehicle based on the EU e-cargo regulations. My gosh, that was kind of like a mouthful to say, but I digress. 
The new vehicle incorporates a completely separate chassis and will cab and it allows for multiple options for the rear of the vehicle. Designed for European cities where like bike lanes, shared zones and well gradients are actually more friendly towards bikes. This electric cargo bike has been designed for like the last mile deliveries of food and drinks or maybe facility maintenance and perhaps utility businesses. It, it means that not only the running costs are like a lot cheaper because well the rider is helping to pedal this mini cargo van assisted mind you by like a motor and batteries it's obviously far healthier uh, form of like commercial transport which will reduce carbon and particulate emissions significantly whilst i appreciate the idea and tech behind this e-cargo bike i do wonder would this work in australia think about like thinking about where i live uh there is basically larger distances between things and well, there's no separate dedicated bike lanes. And well, Australian drivers, they can be generally pretty grumpy when it comes to bikes. So what do you think? Is this something we will see here more and more? Check out Jaguar Land Rover's new contactless screen technology. Known as predictive touch, it uses artificial intelligence and sensors to predict a user's intended target on a touch screen whether it's like satellite navigation, temperature control, or entertainment settings, without actually touching a button. They say, and I'm, like, I'm paraphrasing the press release here, is that to make vehicles safer by keeping a driver's eyes on the road and keeping the environment cleaner and healthier, reducing the spread of bacteria and viruses in a post-COVID-19 world. Now, seriously, I'll address that last bit soon, but. A quick look at the tech. Using artificial sensors and more intelligence, it determines whether or not the user intends to select something on the screen and will predicts and will hopefully speed up the interaction. A gesture tracker uses vision-based radio frequency um, like sensors, which are increasingly common in consumer electronics to combine both contextual information such as user profile, interface design and environmental conditions with data available from other sensors such as an eye gaze tracker to infer the user's intent in real time. Developed with engineers at the University of Cambridge and Jaguar Land Rover's Destination Zero project, they claim on-road trials show predictive touch technology could reduce a driver's uh, touchscreen interaction effort and time by up to 50% and that includes uneven or like poor road surfaces, which can often cause vibrations, think about it, that make it difficult to select the correct button on a touch screen. This means that drivers must like take their attention away from the road and increases the risk of an accident from occurring. Now, firstly, let me address the bacteria and viruses cell point of this. This is pure marketing 101. Let me just clarify, you, me, your family, others who are your, your friends with, if you all share the same sort of car, I guarantee you, you all share hundreds of thousands of bacteria and viruses who live on your skin, on your skin quite harmlessly. They honestly do. In fact, per square centimeter on your skin, you have no less than one million different bacteria. One million, sure. My keyboard warriors out there are now saying, well, Chris, geez, uh, they're not distributed evenly over the body. And well, they're not. So things like the forearm only have about 1,000 bacteria per square centimeter. Whereas under your armpits, you have several million under there. Okay, so more than 1,000 different bacteria from 200 different families of bacterial groups to suggest that you need to not touch something in your car is ridiculous. Just think about it. You touch the door handle to get in. You touch the seatbelt to put it on. You touch in the seat to actually, you know, sit in a car. You have to use the steering wheel and control devices to actually move the car and put it in the direction you want to go. To suggest that you're taking away one part of that equation uh, by having this touchless technology is ridiculous and that needs to stop. But seriously, germs are everywhere and they are not all harmful. Your skin protects you very well. If you think that they are dirty, just wash your hands for 20 seconds. It's very simple, okay? Don't get me started about people wearing gloves in shops at the moment. 
As for the controlling things, well, I have a car and a phone which actually feature touchless systems like changing the radio station, skipping tracks, increasing the volume and more and more. But to be honest, I don't use them. They're just finicky. They're garbage. And they don't work like they're intended to. You know, I've got a Pixel 4 right here, right now, providing me my script that I've written. And I guarantee you, that little Soleil feature that they had in there is, is terrible. And after trying it for one week, I decided it was a feature I did not want. I doubt Jake was saying that bad roads didn't adversely affect their system. Well, I challenge you to, to do this yourself. Next time you're out for a drive and it's safe to do so, hold your hand up, not touching something, and just try to see how still you can keep your finger, you know, both your arm and your hand and your finger, and try and go for a target on your screen without actually touching it. I'm gonna say to you, it's impossible, especially on our, well, great roads. Volkswagen has unveiled its charging plans for its upcoming ID3 and, well, 75 other models that are gonna be released over the next 10 years. In part, with thanks to, well, the Ionia network, which is, well, just, it's actually owned by VW and BMW anyway, there's already like 150,000 public charging points. And I guess some of these have like slower level two charges, maybe? They plan to start with like a one-time access fee of $16.99. We'll call that an unlock fee, shall we? Then the actual monthly recurring charges can be anywhere from like $0 all the way to $30 per month. Free public charging for those on plans or like 50 cents per charging session on the free monthly plan. Using Ioni fast charges, which actually cost them like 50 cents to $1.29 per kilowatt hour. <laughs> Ouch, that's really expensive. That would actually mean like a Tesla standard range plus. You would have ex exhausted that battery completely and filled it all the way up. That would cost you like $64.50 to fill it up to 100%, which you don't do. But if you did, you get the idea. That's more than actually a petrol car. That's very expensive. With orders now being taken for the ID3 and delivers to, deliveries to start in September, this system using the We Connect ID app. It enables users to like easily uh, locate available uh, charges as well as uh, centralize and have one payment system no matter what type of charger you go with within this uh, VW network system. And another feature I really like about this is that it gives you the option to show you only charging points that operate on green power. The system will enable owners to use any one of like the 150,000 charging points and have, again, that one payment method without the need to carry multiple um, you know, NFC cards, uh, subscriptions and logons and things like that. Now, to me, the free or the very cheap cost of public charging sessions is very appealing, but Ioni energy fees are very expensive and well, fails to capitalize on the efficiencies that EVs provide. With Tesla having reached an important milestone of like 2,000 supercharger locations worldwide, with more than 18,000 charging points, this system by Volkswagen of using like existing public and IOTA charging stations is well a great first step and will alleviate any new users' anxiety around where they can actually charge their EV. Okay, time for one of my favorite segments and it's mail time. Last week, I talked about potential pricing for the Model Y in Australia and, well, had a bit of a guess on its price, and that was like 96,000 for the long range and 119,000 for the performance model. That's based upon like the Australian dollar right now and also a bit of a price correction for current Model 3s. Hello, my watch just made some noise. Apologies, let me turn that off. Eventually. Ah, technology, right? Anyway. In the episode, I asked what you're willing to spend, and I got this from just a not her big AI. Is that how you say it? Anyway, after years of buying secondhand cars, the Model Y will be my first new car purchase. I'm planning to spend up to $130,000 for the performance version with all the bells and whistles, all inclusive, including insurance. Pricey, but definitely worth it. Well, that's great to hear, and I hope your dream does come true sooner than later, but more on that later bit, uh, later. On the same episode, I misspoke and said that reservations in Australia for the Model Y, and what I was actually inferring there, and my bad, was that, you know, in America, some people still have reservations for the Model Y. 
even though I can actually already buy it now, and there's only like a five week to nine week delay in actually getting your own. So um, if you've got a reservation, what are you waiting for? Maybe battery day, probably. Mm. And finally, early last week when I posted about the VW charging plans in Europe, here's what some of my awesome patrons said. Holy cow, it's not cheap when converted to Australian dollars. I presume that you can just take your ID3 off to another charger and just pay the fee there. And this, not cheap, but how often would private owners DC fast charge? I guess, look at the usage cases. I suspect the majority of private vehicle owners would try to maximize AC charging at home, street hotels, or work, etc., except when traveling away from daily route, as it's low cost, battery friendly, and where charge time isn't a dominating factor. I use this approach, but that's me. Well, thanks Nigel and Blue EC. Agreed. And look, for the times that I've had an EV and for my own personal use, I've almost never needed to actually use a DC fast charger, except when I was doing long distance trips. So I guess it's gonna be for those type of people, perhaps, and the others were just were like, yeah, those are only fees, I'm gonna skip them, thanks very much. All right, that's a nice, short, sweet mail episode. If you've got any comments about today's show, please do work them down below. And if you wanna join the growing community over there on Patreon, where you get that early access and the other sort of funky stuff I told you before about, please do follow the link down, down there below and help support the channel and where I can hopefully bring you some awesome content real soon, as soon as the restrictions lift. Bytes today is definitely brought to you by Tesla, following the Q2 earnings call, ready? All right, kicking off with Tesla's next Gigafactory in Austin, Texas. Yeah, well, obviously Australia was never going to be considered because we weren't even uh, up for consideration. But of interest I found in this Q2 earnings call was that Elon noted that the 2100 acre plot of land located 12 miles outside of Austin would be stunning and that it's right by the Colorado River, where they're gonna have like a boardwalk and, and make it an ecological paradise. And interestingly, it will be open to the public as well. Congratulations, Texas, and well, condolences to Tulsa, who put on a big bid to try to get Tesla's next massive factory. But alas, no joy. So the question is, with production for the eastern parts of the US being covered by this factory for the Model 3, Y, and Cybertruck, Will that mean that the Model Y deliveries for Australia will start after this factory is built? I may have an answer very shortly. Next, New South Wales government and the NRMA has announced that it will help co-fund at least 20 additional electric vehicle fast chargers to their existing regional network along the state's major highways. Part of a $3 million investment to deliver greener and cleaner travel, the project will help create the most comprehensive regional charging network in the country, which will help further support regional tourism, the economy, and will promote local investment in regional centres. Areas earmarked include Newell, Barrier, New England, and Kimilaroi Highways. The first two charging stations will be installed in Wagga Wagga and Yass, helping to complete the rollout of charges on both the Sturt and Hume highways. By 2022, EV drivers will be no more than 150 kilometers from an EV charging station. What country has an opportunity to be Tesla's next business partner? The answer, Australia. With thanks to Tesla Tom for bringing this to my attention, it turns out that Australia has the highest amount of nickel in the world, 24% no less. Okay, that's great, Chris, but What's so important about this? Well, Elon Musk in the Q2 earnings call called on businesses who are actually in the nickel business to please approach Tesla as he will sign them up to big long-term contracts for their batteries. Elon noted that nickel prices aren't what they used to be. And he said in his statement on the background of why they cut the standard and well standard range plus model Y in the US, citing that the economics and range didn't make sense for Tesla. And that of all the factors influencing Tesla right now is battery production limiting production. Yeah, production, production. You get the idea. So Tesla, about that gigafactory in Texas, 
How about one in Australia alongside a battery production facility like what you have in Nevada? We have a lot of lithium, again, a very one of the world's largest reserves. We've got also the most amount of nickel and a very capable workforce. The Climate Council has released a paper on their vision of how Australia could create 76,000 clean energy jobs in areas like renewable energy, ecosystem recovery, and cleaner, smarter cities. Covering 12 policy points, the Climate Council report, with the link below, shows what smart and learned research can yield. One that the NCCC should probably pay very close attention to. You see, unlike their plan, Mm -hmm. which focuses on fossil fuels and a gas-led recovery, with obviously jobs for mates and returns on investments for investors. Very questionable, very questionable. Watch this video for a bit of, uh, a bit of context here. Anyway, I diverge again. The Climate Council's report notes that their plan will provide jobs for many across the country, especially in regional centres, and how it was actually multifactorial, taking into account a lot of different strategies and different levers that they can pull to make the country better off for everybody, better for the environment, and addresses a lot of very, very important issues. I highly encourage you to take a look at it. Links are below. With the announcement of Giga Texas, Elon hinted at when production might start on the much-anticipated Next Generation Roadster, and in turn, when production will be freed up at Fremont for western parts of the US and in turn Australia and New Zealand for Model Y deliveries. In the earnings call, Elon said, Just think about the next 12 to 18 months. We'll have three new factories in place. Things are looking great with the Giga Berlin, and we'll have a Cybertruck, Semi, Roadster, full self-driving. There's so much to be excited about. It's really hard to kind of fit this in to one call. The Roadster and the Semi were like announced in 2017 at an awesome unveiling, which I think is Tesla's best to date. Kind of felt like a bit of a Steve Jobs Apple keynote thing with like the one more thing. And well, Tesla back then promised the Roadster into production in 2020, but now the automaker is planning to actually release it at the end of 2021. Meaning, I think, 2022 for the Model Y in Australia. But who knows? I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but mm, I've got a good feeling about this. And finally, I'm delighted to announce that I've created a petition demanding the Australian government introduce EV incentives to Australia. Fans of this show already know that electric vehicles are part of the solution to decarbonize our environment, reduce tailpipe emissions, improve air quality, and will help meet the Paris Climate Target Agreements. Whilst many Australians want to purchase an EV and help improve the air we all breathe, prices of EVs are sadly out of reach for many due to the taxes that are levied by the federal and state governments. In many countries of the world, incentives to purchase EVs encourage buyers through mechanism, mechanisms like, like zero sales tax, no stamp duty, no plate fees, personal income tax write-downs, subsidies, rebates, road tax exemptions, free charging, and access to bus lanes. By choosing to drive an EV, you'll be helping in the reduction of local air pollution, total greenhouse gases, and other emissions. Additionally, they also save government significant money through not having to provide fossil fuel companies with the subsidies which in Australia in 2019 totaled $27 billion. To make EVs even more affordable to every Australian, I urge the Australian government to provide tax rebates and other incentives for those that choose to purchase zero emission vehicles. Please Follow this link down below, sign the, sign the petition, and share it with your friends and make our voices heard. Alrighty, that will do it for today. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Again, if you'd like to leave me a comment, I generally reply to some, not all of them, but I try. Uh, put them down below. I do want to hear from you. Uh, consider subscribing, uh, right, join me over here on Patreon, and yeah, look forward to seeing you next week, and I want you to be good, and you be great.